we're going to jump right in because Herman has excellent stories and here's where I think we should start. We should start with the story of you opening the store on Christmas Day. Oh, really? I'm embarrassed. No. Um. <laughs> Let's turn on your mic. There you go. Do I talk into it? Okay. All right, I'll tell that story, and then you have to forget it, or I'll be, <laughs> or I'll be crucified. Please ignore all the cameras in the room. <laughs> um, we were downtown at uh, the address. Then happened to be 222 Second Street, which was a phony address. The real address was something else, but I like the idea of three twos. And um, so. Um, I conceived the idea of opening on Christmas Day. And uh, my wife didn't like it. None of the employees would come to work. So, and it was, I ran a little ad in the paper, two inches high and two inches across, and said, for the real procrastinators, uh, open today, uh, noon to four. Okay, I went down alone, and there was about 10 or 15 people jammed up in the front door waiting to come in <laughs> and um, I was alone waiting on 15 people and the phone never stopped ringing and it was a it was a uh, obviously a church who had written a script and had their members uh, say oh uh, they cursed at me of course and then um, said uh, in Christmas style I've uh, what's that word I'm sacrificing the Lord's Day, um, disparaging the, the Lord's Day. So my combat was, this means you're not coming. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, one of, it, it was one of the best business days we ever had. <laughs> and it was so busy, I, uh, a friend of mine, who maybe some of you may have known a doctor, Larry Cook, anyway, his wife, was a customer there and uh, I put her to work behind the counter and the two of us made it a big day. That was the, that was the story. So that'll teach your ungrateful employees, right? right. You, you'll put the customer And the, no employee would come back, they wouldn't let me do it again. <laughs> really? Even after the numbers? Right. That's in, uh, all right, fair enough. All right, so let's back up a little bit. Let's start with your early life. Uh, let's talk about your early days in Cedar Rapids up through your time in the Air Force and then on through college. Tell us a little bit about where you lived in Cedar Rapids and how the family business grew, those sorts of things. My uh, father moved here from Sedalia, Missouri. Most people have never heard of that town. It's uh, famous be uh, for two reasons. It was the uh, biggest railroad yard in that part of the country, and it was the home of the Missouri State Fair. I was born in 1926, and uh, every year after I was born, my and that's the other reason, oh, it's uh, Missouri State Fair. So every year my mother entered me in the baby contest because the State Fair was just a few blocks down the from the street where we lived. And finally, finally, in 1929, I won. <laughs> I, was, I was the blue ribbon baby of the state of Missouri in 1929, and I have the trophy at home to prove it. <laughs> then my father moved here. He heard about a store here in Cedar Rapids. The, the owner died, the um, widow wanted to sell the inventory. So my father thought he would um, come up here and, uh, and he had a letter from a bank in Sedalia. It was called the Third National Bank. The First National and the Second National both went broke during the crash a year before. So the, it was reorganized and called the Third National Bank. Then. The, uh, the bank gave my father a letter addressed to a fellow here who owned the People's Savings Bank. His name was Frank Welch, and many of you certainly know him or knew of him. And the letter said, this is our customer, Izzy Ginsberg. And one of these pictures I passed around, if you looked at it, is my father with, 
Oh, with his real first name. Okay. <laughs> Iz Izzy was a nickname. So, um, and the widow heard about this letter. Frank Welch publicized it. So, um, my father said what she had wasn't even worth $200. But he repeated and repeated that the, um, he thought he was in Paris compared to Sedalia, Missouri. And he often, throughout his life, he used that phrase. He thought he was in Paris, France, when he was in Cedar Rapids, comparing it to Sedalia, Missouri, which was, which was, happened to also be a segregated town, even though it wasn't that far south. It was uh, 60 miles east and the same parallel as Kansas City. My father came up here, but he didn't like to drive on the highway. So he had a, a black friend drive his car with him as a passenger. Uh, Cedar Rapids was in the north, not segregated. This was 1930, December of 1930. However, and my father would go to eat at a restaurant which was on the corner of 1st Street and 2nd Avenue downtown, the ex exact same corner where the, the Alliant Tower is now. That restaurant wouldn't let the black uh, chauffeur, so to speak, I'll call him a chauffeur, uh, he would, they wouldn't let him in the restaurant. And no hotel uh, would let him in. So he stayed somewhere in the southeast part of town, which is, and I've always uh, bemoaned that because Cedar Rapids isn't segregated, but it sure was. So we think we're so enlightened, uh, think again. So uh, my father had to go to the restaurant, bring the food out to the car, and that's how he ate. My father didn't know what to do. This lady wanted $2,500. She had, by the way, she had three sons. Two of them were professors, I think, at Harvard. One was an MD doctor in Colorado. So these three kids, three sons, were certainly not interested in a dinky little uh, store in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Anyway, my father was standing on 2nd Avenue, right across the street from the Merchants Bank building. And he saw a little boy who looked like he was about 10 years old. Did I ever tell you this? You did. Oh, well, I was going to ask you about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and following behind the boy were a bunch of adults, maybe uh, 15 or 20, just chugging along on the sidewalk across 2nd Avenue, in a picture where, where he is. So he asked someone, uh, what's going on? And someone said, well, that's Billy the Wonder Boy. Billy the Wonder Boy was a 10-year-old kid who was on the stage at the Iowa Theater, is what it was called. It's now called Theater Cedar Rapids. And they, uh, it, is, it was no longer playing movies, but it was a stage theater. So this fellow told my father that Billy the Wonder Boy was on the stage there and he would answer questions from the audience. Now this is an old trick that many, uh, it might be a con game, but whatever. So my father crossed the street and he joined the crowd. And Billy, 10 years old, wanted to, it was Christmas time. So he was going down 2nd Avenue to a department store called Newman's Department Store, if anyone had ever heard of that. It was on the corner of uh, 2nd Avenue and 2nd Street where United Fires, uh, I think their main building is now. So they all followed Billy up to the fifth floor where the toys were and Billy was ignoring the crowd and playing with the toys. And my father said he worked himself to the front of the crowd and he said that he asked, he yelled out, Billy, what should I do? And Billy said, buy it, buy it. And my father said, buy what? He said, the hawk shop, where, they take, where you take your watch. Because it was a pawn shop. It was known as Rosen's Pawn Shop, that, where the owner died. He was Mr. Rosen, R-O-Z-E-N. So my father snapped his finger and said, that did it. So he gave the lady $2,500 for $200 worth of nothing. And uh, we've been here ever since. Right. Business advice from Billy the Wonder Kid. 
led to an empire here in Lynn County. Um, did your dad talk at all about, like, that's a big leap of faith. How, how, did, how did he decide to put his faith in Billy the Wonder Kid? Um, let me think. Well, obviously, Billy the Wonder Kid was a wonder kid. He wasn't called that for nothing, you know. <laughs> well, sure. Okay, that's fair. And that store, by the way, was at um, the 200 block of First Street, where the IE Tower, Alliant Tower, is now. And the building was owned by the Smulikov family. And the building was tilted. I remember that. And if you put a marble on the floor, it would roll away. And he, they were there from 1930 to 1935 in that building. Right. Wow. Okay, so I Googled Billy the Wonder Kid today just to see. Oh, did you find him? Well, it, it, there, there's a... There's a uh, my son did, my son back there did all, he said it was the Orpheum Circuit. Okay, well, that's fair enough. When you, when you Google Billy the Wonder Kid, now you get a soccer phenom. I don't know if the soccer phenom gives business advice, but I suspect <laughs> not. Uh, so th th this is an amazing story, right? And again, I mean, think about the history that stems from this strange moment in the toy department with a 10-year-old with a weird gift. That's very strange, Herman. <laughs> well, my father kept, my mother, by the way, was pregnant with a younger brother. So she stayed in Sedalia for another year. My father was living alone in a room over a grocery store on the west side on 13th Street, the, route, the street that goes to Methwick now. And um, so my father was living alone there for about a year till my mother and the brand new baby, my uh, younger brother, came up. How do you suppose your father explained to your mother in Sedalia that he'd taken the advice of Billy the Wonder Kid? <laughs> she thought he was absolutely out of his mind. <laughs> and she often said that about other, <laughs> other things. <laughs> Did everyone see his picture? This was my father. And it was in, I don't know, 35. 1925 or so. 20. He was the oldest of four. Each one was five years apart. Later I thought, oh, five years apart, that's not very normal. So I thought my grandmother, um, who had my father first, must have had some miscarriages because if you have someone born in 1898, my father, and the next one is 1903, she had to have at least one, maybe two other children miscarried and continuing. The, the third one was f another five years later and the fourth, their fourth one, who all would have been my aunts and uncles. And there, by the way, is my cousin, the son of one of my, one of my father's brothers. So um, anyway, maybe there would have been eight instead of four. Hmm. So talk a little bit about your time in the, in the school district here and, and the various places you lived in town as you were growing up. The first up. place we lived was a house when my mother finally came up was at 1825 Fifth Avenue. Mm. And I've often driven by there and I'm not impressed. <laughs> um, I live in that neighborhood, come on now. <laughs> across, across, fifth, uh, across 19th Street, which was a cross street, and still on, B, on Fifth Avenue was a co-professor named Beardsley Rummel. Have you ever heard that name? I have not. No? Yes. It's famous. Yes. When they deduct income tax from your paycheck, it's because of Beardsley Rummel, who was an economist. He was a professor at Co. later uh, went to Washington and was in the Treasury Department, I think. What do you think of that? And, and it's all his fault. Yeah, and, and he lived up the street from you. He lived on the corner of the Fifth Avenue and 19th Street. <laughs> oh, amazing! All right, in a big house. So you went to you would have gone to all Johnson. right from all right. From, uh, well, first from 1825, we finally got out of that house and moved to 118. See, everything had an 18 in it, not by not not by design, just happened. So we moved to 118 27th Street Northeast. And that's only a block away from Arthur School. That's where I started. Um, I was six years old, probably. And then we moved to um, 1811 Beaver, where I d then transferred to 
a Johnson School. And the Johnson School that's there today is not even similar to the Johnson School I went to. We had a, uh, a wonderful principal whose name was Miss Thompson. Thompson. This is a former Johnson School inmate. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, then um, I re there were many classmates of mine at Johnson. All are dead, everyone. If, I'm the only one alive. And they all went with me to Franklin High School, which then was 7th, 8th, and 9th were called Junior High. 10, 11, and 12 was called Senior High. And the name Middle School was unknown. We never, there was no such a thing. And so then you graduated from Franklin. Franklin, yes. And they had two different kinds of graduations. If, for example, there was an A and a B. If you uh, graduated in June, you were in uh, 10A. If you graduated in January, you were in the B class. I was uh, June of 43, 1943. I should have been in 44 because they started me too early. Not that I was bright, I'm just a, a C, C, C student, yeah. <laughs> then, um, in 1943, like every other guy in my class, and I call them guys, uh, we enlisted. The war was starting. Actually, we enlisted in 1942, but none of us were called up yet until we were 17. So uh, I skipped the graduation ceremony and uh, went, started at the university in summer. Uh, in June of 1943, the year I would have, the year in the month I would have graduated high school, and just started Iowa University and uh, waiting for to be called up, which I eventually was. And then, while you were in the Air Force, and thank you for your service, we should say, um, tell us about your encounter with someone who would go on to be famous in the Air Force. This is the story he's going to forget. I mean, I, that's amazing. A certain person who claimed to have gotten hurt on the obstacle course. Oh, a famous movie actor named Donald O'Connor. Oh. You ever heard of him? Well, apparently he must have been my age because we were together and they were called squadrons. And um, so during basic training, which I had to go through twice, everybody else only did it once. <laughs> I went through basic training. So all of a sudden, he claimed he was hurt on the obstacle course, and uh, they discharged him as, as far as he ever got. And then I went to a movie after the war, and I saw him dancing up. <laughs> I said, well, that, I used the phrase goof off. <laughs> he, was, he was a liar, but anyway. He, he got out and they became famous and he's, I think he's dead now. Is he? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that is how the stories tend to end. It's true. <laughs> Donald O'Connor flipping off the walls after claiming to be injured. Re yeah, yeah. That's what, that was his story. So you get out of the Air Force. And I like what you said to us when we came to the store to talk to you. You said you couldn't wait to get into the Air Force well, and as soon as you were in. I couldn't wait to get in. And the day I got in, I couldn't wait to get out. I hated it. Um, I, used to, I remember in the barracks, they used to have three rifles with bayonets uh, standing in the middle of the barracks in groups. And I, I like to wrestle. So I was wrestling with some other kid in the barracks, and I fell against the bayonet and hit my fi this finger. And I was going around holding it together because it was split. So all of a sudden I noticed it was starting to heal and I would have six fingers. <laughs> so I went to the hospital and they fixed it up and you can still see a little bit of the scar. <laughs> 
this is either the easiest or the most difficult hosting job I have ever <laughs> taken on. Uh, no one warned me about the wrestling. I don't think that's part of the program this evening, uh, but we'll, <laughs> we'll keep you posted. So tell us about your, so you, you get out of the Air Force, you return to the University of Iowa. You were in a fraternity there. Oh yeah. Well, um, I finally, um, well, when I came back to Iowa, I didn't know where to go. My br younger, a younger brother, Lou, his name was Louis, Louis, and um, he played football at Franklin High School. And he would, during high school football practice, he would run away, get on the Crandeek, if uh, everyone here has heard of the Crandeek, and uh, go down to Iowa City in his high school football uniform and the cleats and all that stuff and he would find his way to where the university football players were practicing and he would run around with the big boys. And then at dinner time, he wasn't there. So my father would got, always got so mad, he had to drive to Iowa City, find him, pick him up, bring him back. But he did this many times. Um, later, Louis did play at the university football. Where was I? Seems like the least they could do is let him play, right? <laughs> After <laughs> being in trouble with your dad like that all the time. Now, we were uh, going to talk about the fraternity. Okay. When I got out of the Army in, in 1945, the war was over, and they dropped the big bomb. So they discharged my whole entire unit. By the way, when I was in the service, I was at a air base in Hobbs, New Mexico. It was a base where they were training tail gunners for the B-17 airplane and co-pilots for the same airplane. The tail gunners couldn't get in through the plane in that little bubble they had at the back of the plane. So they had to reach up and pull themselves up feet first into that thing. A lot of the young boys who were learning to be tail gunners would get air sick and they would vomit all over. Well, my main job was to, <laughs> that's what I always did. Whenever they got air sick, they gave me a hose and I had to go out there and climb up and hose that out. And, and by the way, that's where Roswell is, right next to Roswell, where all the alien, the people from Mars are there. <laughs> What happened at that fraternity that you don't want to talk about? Oh, the <laughs> well, um, my brother had also started summer school at Iowa about 1944, I think. He was a couple years younger than me. So when he started Iowa in the summer, he uh, lived at a fraternity house on Dubuque Street. I can't remember the name, Sigma something. So. Um, so, when school started in September of that year, my brother thought, oh, he innocently said, well, we'll just stay there and join the fraternity. Well, he was blackballed for ethnic reasons. So, um, the other fraternity, which he eventually joined, was called Phi Epsilon Pi, which was a bunch of other ethnics. So um, they, they didn't have, all the other fraternities had athletes. This fraternity that wanted him wanted an athlete. So they picked him because he was the right ethnicity and uh, he was on the football team even as a freshman. So, okay, so I went over there and just moved in. <laughs> I was not invited, not, uh, what do you call it, pledged? Not pledged. I was not, nothing. Rush. I just walked in, roomed with my brother, <laughs> and uh, that was it. <laughs> but we had the highest grade point average of any of the other fraternities. Every year, constantly. Because they graded it. Even, even after they let the one athlete, your brother, in. Yeah. They, they kept the, the there are a lot of other stories I'm just not going to repeat. <laughs> Remember, he was willing to talk about Roswell rather than to continue to talk about the fraternity. <laughs> one, my, my, bro, my brother um, 
my brother was captain. They used to have a captain on each game instead of for the season then. So one game, Iowa was playing Minnesota. And they had, my brother weighed 185 pounds. Minnesota had two big All-Americans. One was named Leo Namalini, who no one's heard of, I guess. And the, oh, you do? And the other was a fellow whose last name was Tonamaker. Uh, anyway, they're from Minnesota. So, <laughs> so at, for, that, for, for that particular game, my brother had broken a bone or two in his hand from some previous game. So after they flipped the coin, you're supposed to shake hands. So instead, he just turned his back on these two guys who were the co-captains of Minnesota and walked away. So they're sitting there with their hand, standing with their hands out and no one's shaking them. And that was all on film apparently. So um, that made him mad. And you can imagine two big guys like that. And my brother was a left guard. These two guys were right on the line too, I think. They beat him up terribly for the insult. But he saved his hand. <laughs> All right. See, you guys have trouble with your hands. You, you six fingers for you. Six, yeah, right. <laughs> Back to five. There you go. OK. so. Let's talk about the store. Let's talk about all the locations of the store. And As I said, the first store was at uh, two something First Street Southeast, where the IE Lion Tower is now. After the first term of the five year lease was up in 1935, uh, Smulikov propositioned my uh, father that they have an empty room. And of course, the room he was in was being condemned. But the Around the corner on First Avenue was a room, empty room, and around the corner on Third Avenue. In those days, in 1935, First Avenue was a busier shopping street than Third Avenue. So my father picked the Third Avenue location. <laughs> and <laughs> what, did I say that wrong? <laughs> anyway, uh, no, he picked First Avenue. Oh. That, that's what I meant to say. And um, in that First Avenue store, he was at there from 1935 to 1940. But in that five-year period, he conceived the idea of having an, an accordion band. And he hired two brothers and a cousin, all named, uh, last name was Girardi. And they were accordion players from Old Wine, Iowa. So they organized and they were giving accordion lessons. My, we were selling accordions in addition to other strange things. <laughs> we, one of the, we sold barn red paint, only one color. We sold paint in a jewelry store. And um, we, whenever my folk, parents and I and us went riding Sundays, he, that's my paint, that's my paint, that's my paint. <laughs> So barn red, oh, that's why it could be why all the barns around here are barn red. <laughs> so anyway, we had this um, amateur hour and the WMT radio was, would come into the store with, a, uh, with an announcer whose name was Bert Puckett, who no one's ever heard of. This was in the 1935 era. So Bert, and, and my father had a gong you know, he knew nothing about music. He enjoyed classical music, really did. But if he didn't think the singer or the, or the violinist or the, were good enough, he would gong them out. And he, and, he called it, and he called it Ginsburg's original amateur hour. Which it was, it was his original amateur. So he, um, later he showed me a letter from a nationally known uh, amateur hour uh, Head, head of a uh, named Major Bowles. Now, has anyone ever heard of that? Yeah. He was on radio and it was, uh, he's, his letter said he wanted permission to call his show Major Bowles' original amateur hour. My father said he never answered the letter, but Major Bowles continued calling his, later he was on television with the same amateur hour, with real performers, I think. Instead of, but these other performers that my father had were, later Bert Puckett, the WMT announcer, moved to Chicago, changed his name 
to Bert Wilson. Has anyone ever heard of that name? He became the, annu the announcer for the Chicago Cubs, and he was just before Harry Carey. Harry Carey became more famous, I guess, but Bert Puckett was there for several years before Harry Carey. So your, your father would, I just want to make sure I've, I've got this right, he would gong the violin players while voluntarily putting accordion players on the stage. Is that right? Yes, but if they weren't good enough, he'd gong. Oh, he would also gong the... And he, uh, one of uh, these Girardi brothers became teachers of, accordion, uh, of the accordion. One of their only famous one was, um, there was a guy whose name I can't remember, but he became... He had a band here in town also for WMT. Leo Greco. Yeah, that was it. Leo Greco. So Leo Greco was taking lessons from Al Girardi. And I have a picture somewhere of the entire accordion band and my brother and I in our Cub Scout uniforms are in front with the baby accordions. We were probably seven or eight years old then. Working toward that accordion badge. Right. <laughs> All right, so there are more stores to come. You've only moved a couple of times at this point in this. Okay, 1940, we moved across the around the corner to 205 Second Street, which is in the lobby of the security building, which was owned by the light company. And uh, Southern Dows was the owner or the president of the light company. You know Southern Dows. <laughs> <laughs> and um, his Southern Dows daughter married Dwayne Arnold, who everyone has heard of. And, uh, and they had a son also named Sud Dows Jr. And he and I together went somewhere and we got our so first social security number. So whatever my number is, his is one number different on the end. <laughs> Sud Dows Jr. And by the way, Sud Dows Sr. owned all the land where Sutherland Square is now. And the school board wanted to build their high school there. And he wouldn't sell. So they even offered to name it Sutherland High School. Did you know that? It was, it was true. And um, he still refused to sell. And he hired the, uh, an architect from, who was the son of the Franklin High School football coach to design all of the houses in Southern Square, or most of them. And that's, that's why the high school is called Washington instead of Sutherland, and where it's catty corner from where it is now. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sort of proud of being a Washington graduate. I don't know how I'd feel about being a Sutherland. Graduate. Southern, yeah. <laughs> Great day to be a warrior. I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead of you, but I am eager to hear about Ginsburg okay. Jewel Box. Oh, I can't tell that job. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll come back to it later. We were at, we were at 205, and we called it, he, he's heard of a store in Washington, D.C. that was called the Little Jewel Box. So my father's, this store in the security building at 205 Second Street was 14 feet wide and 20 feet, 20, 22 feet deep. So it's a miniature store. So he had a great big sign against the, the building it said little letters Ginsburg, then a great big word jewel, cat a corner at 45 degrees, then the word box in the corner. Um, should I tell this story? You absolutely should tell this story. Yes. Well, well, I take full responsibility. The EL from jewel and the JEW from jewel were on two separate circuits, apparently. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, for entertainment, my parents and all of our relatives and my grandma, used to, who was illiterate, couldn't read or write, um, we, we'd go riding and we'd go ride past the store and we'd say, Ginsburg's Jew box. <laughs> the EL was burned, always burned out. And you can imagine how mad my mother would be. <laughs> and she said, Izzy, will you get that goddamn sign fixed? <laughs> 
<laughs> so that was... Anyway, we were at that location from 1940 to 1956. In 56, we were approached to buy out another jewelry store here in town. The owner was a bachelor by the name of Joe Okono. He came here in 1920 to manage a store that was being opened by a chain of stores out of St. Paul called Goodman's. And for some unknown reason, instead of calling the store in Cedar Rapids Goodman's Jewelry, they called it uh, Okono's Jewelry. Let, even though he wasn't the owner, but what he did, he bought the building. This was a, a rickety uh, two or three story building adjacent on 2nd Avenue to the 12 story Merchants Bank building. And it was 60 feet with three storefronts. One front was a woman's dress store called Wolf's, then a luggage store called Ensler's, which many have heard of, and then Okono's Jewelry Store. And then next to it was a 40 foot front building which had a shoe store called the Big Shoe Store that was owned by a fellow named uh, Sam Cohn, C-O-H-E-N. And next to it was O'Meara's Men's Clothing Store, I'm sure. The bank bought all, the, all that 100-foot property. And we had a handshake agreement with Joe Okono that when our first five-year term was up in that building on, at 216 Second Avenue, we could buy the building. So the five years were up, my brother and I went up to Joe Okun. Joe Okun was a bachelor, was the first tenant in the Roosevelt Hotel, lived in the corner suite in the hotel on the 12th floor. And I remember he said, you're too late, boys. Boys, we were in our 30s. <laughs> uh, he just sold the building to the bank. So what? You can't, you promised. Too bad. Okay, so we had several options, as a matter of fact. So the bank kept bodgering us. They wanted us out so they could build that present uh, new addition, which is next to the 12-story uh, bank. And we wouldn't leave. Meanwhile, um, we, uh, oh, by the way, Okano, whenever, during the 1920s, and when the crash came in 1930s, he, uh, whenever he needed money, he was a big burly guy, tough guy, and he apparently was a wrestler in his youth. He was in his 50s or 60s when we were dealing with him. He would go down to a little town, I think it was either Solon or Ely, and challenge any um, resident of that town to a wrestling match for money. <laughs> and uh, that's how he, and he won. He was uh, that good of a wrestler, and it was, I don't think it was as nice as the catch us catch can type of wrestling they do in colleges. No, they were brutal. They were elbowing and choking with double, what do you call it? Uh, no, but he often won, he said. He won enough money to keep the store going. And the same exact thing happened to May's Drugstore. Now, everyone knows about May's Drugstore, and who, because the average age here would have known uh, about May's Drugstore. The owner was a guy named Alec Gelb, G-E-L-B. He went bankrupt in w Madison, Wisconsin, and moved here and talked the Swinlikovs into renting him the room on Second Street. He was a hab habitual gambler. And whenever he needed money, he would take, go to all the cash registers, or whenever he had to meet the, the uh, payroll, he said. He would take money out of the cash registers, go to this town, shoot craps and win enough money to keep the store going. <laughs> and that's an absolute true story also. So we had these two guys, one was a wrestler, one was a gambler, and they survived by doing their best. So anyway, in 1956, we bought Okono's store. And uh, he was a bachelor, like I said, and at the time there used to be a radio program called the $64 Question on radio. Later, it went on television and became the $64,000 question. It, was a, it must have been a question and answer program. One of the sponsors was a, a pen and pencil company named Eversharp. And we were Eversharp pen dealers. We, and they came out with a solid gold, real gold pen and pencil set 
in 14 karat gold that was $64. That pen said, if you can find any today, uh, just add a couple zeros. That's really what it would go for. So no one the, in those days would pay six, $64 for a pen. No one. But uh, the buyer, the only buyer of those pens, and we had several of them because they made us buy the several of those $64 pen sets. The only buyer was a, a fellow who would come here once a year for the All Iowa Fair at Hawkeye Downs. And he had a concession, it was like a carnival. And he, if you threw the balls in a hole, three, I think three of the balls in the hole, you got this solid gold pen set for $64. Well, he made sure um, no one until the end, until they spend enough money ever, ever won. But he would buy several of these $64 pen sets from us. What do you think of that? <laughs> I don't know what to think of that. I'm not sure how, how we arrived at Hawkeye Downs and the carnival. Then, okay, <laughs> so we got Okinawa wrestling and we got Ellie Gelb uh, shooting craps. Right, right, that is how we ended up there. Okay. Then, all right, then from Okinawa, we did eventually sell uh, the, um, we agreed to the bank that we would leave early. But we, want, we owed the bank $20,000 then, more or less. And uh, finally, uh, the vice president, a fellow named S.E. Cocolette. His real name was St. Elmo yep. Cocolette. You knew him. And um, he, we argued, he said, he offered, I don't know, probably 3,000. We wanted 20,000. Finally, he, said, he came in one day and he had two $10,000 cashier's checks and he threw them at me. And I caught him. <laughs> I endorsed them over to the bank and our loan was paid off. And then we moved to the corner of 2nd Avenue and 2nd Street. That entire building was Armstrong's department store from 2nd Avenue all the way back to the alley. In fact, if you look on the 2nd Avenue side on about the third or fourth floor is a plaque that says Warner. So the owner was a guy named Tom Warner, W-A-R-R-I-N-E-R. And he was a civil engineer here in Cedar Rapids, and he was 99 years old at the time. He had two sons, both li one lived in California and the other lived in New York City and was an executive for a big time advertising agency. He was here one time uh, to see his father. So uh, Warner Jr. and I went out on the sidewalk and uh, made a deal out there to buy the building. Now, the building was 70 feet on 2nd Avenue and 40 feet, no, 70 feet, yeah, and 40 feet on 2nd Street. But it was connected to Armstrong's building called the SGA building. And that, those letters stand for Samuel G. Armstrong, which was Bob Armstrong's father. So, okay, uh, the Warner, Tom Warner was sharp enough at age 99 or whatever he made the deal with Armstrong that there was no wall between his building and the SJ building which extended all the way to the alley between uh, between uh, second and third streets um, but he got six, he his deal with Armstrong's he would get six percent of every sale made in arm the entire building not just in his por portion so he was bleeding Bob Armstrong terribly. Armstrong was hemorrhaging money. So to prevent that, he, um, Armstrong moved to 3rd Avenue, which is where he ended up when he was back in business. And um, so we then bought that 70 by 40 feet from Warner, but Armstrong continued running the SG building as an office building. Now another strange thing about that deal, there was, a, there was an easement, if you know what that is. We started at 2nd Avenue and it went through, that, and through the Warner building, through the uh, Armstrong building, over to the alley. And it was for the light company, I guess, or some reason, I don't know why the easement was there. However, right on top of that easement was the, the, main, the only elevator in the SGA building. So Armstrong and I, I used to go up to his office and we argued and yelled at each other. And uh, finally, in order to make the deal I wanted, 
I said, you're going to have to get uh, your elevators on the easement. Get it, off, get it off the easement. And I remember he said, the building will fall down. I don't care. <laughs> drop, the, <laughs> drop the building. So um, all of a sudden, along came Securities Corp of Iowa. And they approached me. And they said, either you sell that Warner portion of the building to us, or we're going to move to Hiawatha. I said, good. Get rid of it. <laughs> Go to Hiawatha. Anyway, they eventually bought the SGA building and um, our, the Warner building. So in 1950, no, 56, no, that was 1970. In 77, I believe, we then moved back to Second Street. And uh, there was a store there called Moto Day, a ladies dress store which we, uh, their lease was up, and we moved into that. And that building was owned by the Dows. Also, we're back when, in the clutches of the Dows. <laughs> and there was, it's so That's really, the name of his memoir? Back in the clutches <laughs> of the Dows. So uh, the, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean. <laughs> <laughs> so he, um, there was really two buildings, an old building where, the motor, where we ended up, and the new eight-story building. So uh, we were in the old part. And Woolworths had been there in, in an L-shaped building. They had an entrance on 2nd Street where we went and over on 2nd Avenue. So their Woolworth dime store was this way. They moved to what used to be Newman's department store. And just before it became United Fire, they opened the dime store on the first floor in the basement of what was Newman's department store. So we stayed in that 205. We changed, it was, the real address was, um, I don't know, 212 Second Street. We changed it to 222 Second Street be only because I like 222s two on, the, on the building. That's the only reason. And the post office went along with it. Well, I mean, you were a guy who yelled at Bob Armstrong, so of course the post office. You know, you know, I know something about Bob Armstrong. Before I ever, ever, ever go up to his office to yell and argue with him, I would stop at his perfume counter and spray myself with uh, the, in the men's perfume. And I, I told him that one time when I was up there, and um, he said it, he didn't care. He lost his sense of smell during the first... <laughs> That's, that's exactly, during the First World War, he, some bullet hit his nose or something. He, he, he couldn't smell. <laughs> Before we get sued by all the uh, various families who make this town great, um, let me jump ahead. I can tell they're eager to ask you questions, but before I let them pepper you with questions, let's jump ahead to 2008 and the flood uh, and the decision after seven or eight locations in downtown Cedar Rapids, all this history in downtown Cedar Rapids, to move the store out well, of Well, we didn't know what to do. The store, we had bought that building. The building was being used by, it was across the alley from his main building on 3rd Avenue. Across the alley was this room in a, in a three or four story building. And we went in there and he had been, Armstrong had been using it as a sports department, sporting department. So we went in there and uh, completely renovated the inside and the outside of the building and had a jewelry store there from 1993 until 2008, the flood. And um, we had no flood insurance. And in fact, John Ely, who he, you have a picture of him here somewhere, he, um, his grandfather was born on that lot in the back end by the alley. Uh, he, that's what he told me. And so there we are. So we finally found a temporary location uh, by Lindell Plaza next to a store called Michael's, which is, um, they sell thread, I think, and picture frames. And we were there until we found our present location. And we were in a uh, bid, or comp we were in competition, not a bid, but in competition with a national den uh, dental chain called Aspen, who now finally has built a building where used to be a, a, 
West, western type rest Lone steak. Star. Lone Star ste uh, steak. So that's, Aspen always wanted to be where we are. Instead, we, we got the spot, and that was the last spot in that, in that shopping area. And what has it meant for the business to move out of downtown and into that location? Well, actually, it, it has not hurt us. There is no retail anymore downtown. There's only lawyers, banks, uh, not even doctors, uh, bars and restaurants, and that's it downtown. Uh, all retail is now on the outline shopping centers and the shopping uh, strips. We are in what I would call it a shopping strip. And for retail jewelry stores like we are, um, a freestanding store is the thing, not within a shopping center. Freestanding stores are what every uh, jewelry store who knows what they're doing is going to have now, instead of being a store within a, a mall. And that's only one of the reasons that shopping centers nationally are not doing so well, but they'll recover. All right, so that brings us to the present. I'm going to open it up to you to ask him questions about Roswell, about the fraternity, about Donald O'Connor, about whatever is on your mind. Uh, I suspect he'll be honest with you. So Yes. Herman, I'd just like to ask about your family and, and uh, how you met your wife and, and talk a little bit about your family. My, uh, my wife uh, was from California, but she had gone to Skokie, Illinois, to live with an aunt and uncle and to attend what was called then uh, Northern Illinois State Teachers College. And now it's called Northern Illinois University. And uh, one of her classmates then, uh, or, yeah, classmates, was from Cedar Rapids. Her name was Harriet Oshman, is a maiden name. And uh, her husband, she was married to a guy, another guy from Cedar Rapids named Bill Kushner, who was a Navy pilot and was killed during the war. So she then, uh, Harriet uh, Kushner then, was a teacher at that school. And um, I had a friend here in town who had two sisters living in a Chicago area. And I used to go with him to, when he visited teachers and the, and the sisters would fix him up and maybe introduce me to some girl and would have a date for the weekend and drive back. So Harriet called me and said, next time you come in, I want you to meet this uh, girl that's teaching here with me. So I did, and uh, we got married. <laughs> Simple as that. Eight, six or eight months later. Not her her name was Phyllis. Maybe some of you knew her. You didn't get married that first weekend. No, I, in fact, I couldn't spell her last name. I didn't know how to find her again, <laughs> really, because her, her last name was Berman with two N's on the end. So I was trying to get a hold of her again and I didn't know it was two N's. I look in, in the Chicago phone book with, and there were a page, a whole page of her Berman's with one N. And I didn't think to look on two N's. Finally, I found her. <laughs> you needed Billy the Wonder Kid to help. Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> when would ever happen? Steve, didn't you try to find what, where Billy was? I tried, and uh, under various names, Billy the Wonder Kid, Billy the Wonder Boy, Billy the Wiz, Billy. <laughs> I, I couldn't find him. Just sitting back there Googling Billy. But he was on a regular vaudeville circuit, wasn't he? I, 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 all the circuits that came through town from 1930 to 1935, I, I couldn't find him. So he was really low on the totem pole of acts. <laughs> done fast, maybe he would go on, so he probably didn't get paid much. There you go. Well, John Barrymore came here, too, and he was, um, um, I saw him, and he was a drunk, and I, I saw him walking along 3rd Street, going from 2nd Avenue toward the theater, and he was staggering so much, and he w must have been in a play or something at the theater, and also there was another play called uh, Give Him Hell Harry, and it was a one-man play and I can't think of the name of the actor it was on Broadway and then came here and um, so the guy who came here and put on the, was a famous movie actor and he came in a store to, his watch was broken or something and also another famous 
uh, celebrity who came in our store when we were on the corner was Richard Nixon's brother, who also was a drunk, <laughs> really a drunk, and he was, he was an inmate of the, uh, of the estate that Tom Riley bought. The university owned it, and they kept drunks there to dry him out. Lakeside. Lakeside, yes. And uh, Richard Nixon's brother was in there drying out. And his watch was broken, and he came in the store, and I met him, and... Did you fix his watch? I hope so. I, uh, <laughs> that way, I didn't care about it. This family were Quakers. The what? They were Quakers. Quakers? Yeah. Well, he was certainly a drinker, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes, ma'am. What was your favorite part of the jewelry business? Seeing young couples come in and being so happy. And I used to use the phrase, we're a jewelry store. We're not a mortuary. <laughs> and people are always happy. I remember Phyllis told me once about how the payments could be arranged for like 25 cents a week to buy. Oh, that. we used to have a billboard. Yeah. And uh, our, my father th thought up the slogan, walk in with a dime and walk out with a diamond. Yeah. What it meant was uh, a minimal deposit when you bought a diamond. And the average diamond ring sale then was probably two or three hundred dollars. Now it's just the minimum is probably two or three thousand in uh, okay <laughs> yes when did you take over the business from your dad when we bought okono jewelry store my father actually walked away and did nothing i was self i had to teach myself what to do and my father would only come down on sunday mornings we had linoleum on the floor at okono's he would mop the floor wash the windows and hose the sidewalk and a lot of people were walking around downtown then unlike now and he was his hobby was stopping people and talking he would talk about every imaginable subject i remember often he sat he sat down on a bench where the crosswalks are at co college in the in the in the quad area <coughs> And as the students were changing classes, a lot of them were going to this, and he would stop them, and he wouldn't let them leave, and would talk and talk, and, and they could only leave if they were going to be so late for the classes. It's really a shame that that gift for conversation didn't pass down to the next. Well, whatever he said made sense. It really did. Okay. I think everything you have said tonight made, made sense as well. Hope so. <laughs> no I'm more sure that, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead. Any more questions? Oh, we do. Did I cover it every, yes ma'am, sir. Herman, what's the most important thing you've learned in your 90 some years? <laughs> Not just in jewelry business. Whatever you want to tell me. I'm thinking. There are many, there are many, many things. Relationship are absolutely important. That, that overshadows everything. And uh, people who don't pay attention to what's going on in the world uh, do a disservice to the world. And I remember uh, one comment my father also, one of the many, many comments he made, if you tell the truth, you only have one story to tell. <coughs> All right. I think we're going to leave it there. I'm sure that Herman would be happy to talk to you individually. I thank you all for being here. I'll remind you that it's Giving Tuesday. Sign up to be a member for the History Center of the History Center. And uh, be sure to be checking the History Center website for the upcoming holiday events. There's one this coming Saturday, one the following week. Also, coming up soon in early January, Grown Up Show and Tell, which I am very excited about, where you can bring in your things and and tell the assembled masses what they are and why they're important. So keep an eye on our website for more information about that. Again, thank you for being here tonight. Please help me thank Herman one more time. <laughs>